All right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We've got a fun event today. Wes Harden is back with his Dusty Series, and he's got a pretty special one here, one that I haven't tried myself. It should be fun. He's got an old version of J.W. Dant, you know, pre-fire, so he'll talk a little bit exactly about what that means and all that, versus today's version, so it should be fun. It's a, it's a blind tasting, so you're not going to know. You've got two listed there, number one and number two. You don't know which is which. We'll reveal that at the end when we tell Wes what our favorite is, and we'll see what ends up getting voted the favorite of this one. Should be fun. With that, I'd like to introduce now Mr. Wes Harden. Hey, Wes. Hey, Steve. How's it going? Good, man. Good. So this is a this is a, should be a fun one, right? Classic. Oh yeah, band. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited about this one. This is uh, this is one of these I call it uh, bourbon community. It's not really a myth, but it's one of these bourbon community things where. Uh, there's all these little cliques of people that are really into certain aspects of the bourbon community and pre-fire heaven hills one of those and there's a lot of people that uh, swear that the, the pre-fire heaven hill is phenomenally better than today's bernheim distilled and we'll get into some of that later so i thought uh, i was able to, to get a bottle of jw dant uh, pre-fire uh, i like that choice because it has not really changed age or anything over the years they're both bottled and bond they're both four year it's literally as close to a pre-fire versus post-fire uh correlation that we could get so i thought let's blind taste it and see uh if pre-fire is everything or is it uh, somewhat of hype yeah so yeah, just to get everybody up to speed too pre-fire refers to the fact there was a fire at heaven hill what, what was the date like november 7th 1996 yeah, no, yeah november 7th uh 96 it uh there was a fire there if we're if we're ready we can get into that or if you want if you got something else you want to go no no whatever you'd like to talk about i don't want to all right so i, I think yeah. you know a, a lot or most people uh, uh on the call tonight anybody that that will listen probably has heard of heaven hill pre-fire they definitely have heard of the the fire uh, at Heaven Hill in 96. Uh, so I went in, kind of dug a little more information out. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a fire that happened uh, November 7th of 1996. Uh, and it was at the Heaven Hill Distillery and their DSP was KY DSP 31. Uh, so just as a reference, if, uh, if anyone runs across any older looking Heaven Hill brands, so uh, the old 12 year age stated Elijah Craig, uh, 12 years, um, these, uh, mellow corn, uh, there's a pre-fire version of that. There's Evan Williams. There's uh, all their different brands. We got the JW Dant. If you find any, uh, dusty heaven Hill, one of the, the, the surefire, no pun intended, surefire <laughs> way of determining if it's pre-fire, which would mean, which means it was distilled at the distillery, uh, that burned to the ground on heaven Hills property. So, uh, that would be DSP 31. Yes. So that's Bardstown, Kentucky. So absolutely. So, that's yeah. Bardstown. And I think, I think when people think of heaven Hill, they just assume that, you know, it's a Bardstown based company. They're distilling everything in Bardstown. They're not, they, nope, they, they're, they, they're they, not distilling anything in Bardstown. That's well, correct. The, that's the, the real secret there. So yeah, yeah the fire started uh, at night, actually on November 7th, 96. Uh, one of our huge Ohio Valley storms came through uh, and this one had, crazy wind so it had winds up to 75 miles an hour it had heavy rains and it was a pretty fierce lightning storm uh there's really no one uh and, and i think uh, you know insurance evaluators and fire department officials and so forth no one really pegged exactly what the true definitive cause of the fire the general consensus and the general um opinion is based on the lightning strikes that were happening and how quickly um, the fire started and how quickly and how hot it ran. And, uh, you know, there's some, you know, they had barrels literally exploding with, you know, bourbon that was on fire shooting everywhere. It's this crazy thing that happened. They're pretty sure that a lightning strike, uh, in warehouse one is what started it. So, uh, it did not start in the distillery, uh, according to, uh, the investigators and the people from heaven Hill, they think that uh, lightning strike happened on warehouse one, uh, and it started, the, the damage was so devastating right in that area that it literally obliterated that warehouse and everything in it. And it was it, it, to the point where the, the, the fire marshals really couldn't determine other than they know it started in warehouse one, uh, but they could not determine if it was anything other than a natural cause. So 
you know, if, if someone decided, hey, this is a great time to cash in a big insurance plan, they weren't caught. I'm not suggesting that happened. I'm just saying it was such a such a devastating event that it basically destroyed all evidence is what really happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would assume that's a problem, Wes, when everywhere around you is fuel. I mean, that whiskey right. is just barrels and barrels of fuel once a fire starts. So absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. and so what happened was it started in it expanded in the warehouse. Barrels are exploding. Uh, it was sending literal fireballs in the air and then rivers are burning whiskey. So just, just mm-hmm. think of that term, like just think. So it, it's the, it's what I would call the whiskey. And a lot of people that described it was the whiskey equivalent equivalent of a volcano erupting and the magma and the lava coming down. Uh, and so this, this burning whiskey ran out of the warehouse and it ran downhill towards other warehouses. So at the time there were 42 warehouses on site Seven of those were on fire uh, and they created this flaming whiskey and and it made its way to the distillery and it burned the distillery to the ground, like burned everything to the ground, nothing there. It was it was to the point where there's no salvaging it. There's no resurrecting it. Uh, The fire department at that time, when, when they were on scene, they knew based on how flammable the wood the, the whiskey, all the chemicals in the distillery, every, like if there's one thing that a distillery and a distillery campus is, if anything, it smells great. It's great whiskey. It's a great place to be when you're there on site. You just feel like you're in, in a part of time that's not around anymore. But if it's anything, it's flammable and it's dangerous. Like there's mm-hmm. stories and stories and stories uh, back in pre-prohibition days. If you read through a lot of the history books of you know, it's just a dangerous place. People catch on fire. People fall in, you know, hot vats of whiskey and mash and burn themselves. It's just, it's a dangerous place, uh, a distillery. Uh, and when it, when a building gets struck uh, with lightning and you have exploding barrels of, of whiskey and a river of whiskey, then you can expect uh, damage. So seven of the 42 warehouses went down. Uh, that distillery went down. Uh, and the fire department got there and they they figured out pretty quickly what we need to do is keep a constant, as many constant streams of water on the surviving warehouses as possible. We're not gonna stop this fire. We gotta let this stuff burn out. But what we can do is keep it from consuming all 42 warehouses. Mm -hmm. So their concentration from a firefighting standpoint, I'm sure they put some effort towards what was actually burning. Their, Their concentration was, let's prevent any more destruction. Let's let it burn out where it's at. It's already done its damage. Let's let's make sure it only it only damages and burns what it's burned so far. Uh, it's uh, the news helicopter said they could see it see the fire from as far as like 24 or 25 miles away. Uh, if you go on to YouTube, all you have to do is Google Heaven Hill 1996 fire. There's plenty of videos from the news helicopter and so forth. Uh, it's it's impressive. It was a destructive thing, but just as just to see how fire can can grow and expand and and, and and create destruction so quickly, it's a it's a pretty amazing video to watch if if you guys haven't watched it before. Um, so what's weird is the headquarters was not uh, damaged in any way, the bottling plant was not damaged, and seven of the forty two warehouses uh, were either fully destroyed or to a point where it was. Uh, more instrumental to pull out any barrels they could salvage and just destroy it and build back. Uh, in total, there were 90,000 barrels that were lost in the Rickhouse fires. Uh, and at the time, those 90,000 barrels in 1996 represented about 2% uh, percent of the U.S.'s, uh, the U.S. distillers' uh, amount of whiskey available. So if you can imagine all of the distilleries that were around in 1996, which are all the main ones that are here today, minus some of the craft distilleries, 2% of their collective lot of aging whiskey went up in flames in one night yeah. out of, out from one location. That tells you, and that was, and so think about it. If you do the math, that's 90,000 barrels. The assumption is that all 90,000 barrels lost were in those seven damaged or burned warehouses that just tells you how much whiskey was sitting around at Heaven Hill at the time. And this is back in 96 before the boom. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I'll tell you, it, it, it seems like the, those firefighters did a hell of a job because to only lose seven, you know, one, six out of it, it, when you see this fire, ra- you know, raging st- multiple stories in the air, um, the, you know, it's amazing. It didn't get more. So uh, the, the fact that they did is really a, an amazing testament to the, the their knowledge and hard work. To Yeah, it absolutely that, so. is. And it's, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a fire triage kind of reaction that they gave all right, we know that these structures are, are, are beyond repair, beyond salvaging. What do we do to save everything else? Now, they will admit, and the people at Evan Hill and a lot of, uh, a lot of people that have read, and have read reports and talked to the fire department, uh, they got lucky in a way. There, there were a lot of the structures that did not get uh, damaged or did not get caught on fire, simply didn't because they were at a higher elevation than where the Whiskey River, they call it, was flowing. So if, if this, what they had said is if this had happened at the, at the highest elevated uh, point of a warehouse and had flown through the whole property, it may have taken the whole thing down mm-hmm. before they could get there and do anything about it. So they were part lucky of what warehouse and what location it was in and where it hit. They obviously lost their distillery, which was probably the single biggest loss uh, yeah. in the whole operation no so, deaths no deaths so, no deaths no yeah, deaths whatsoever is, yeah. uh and they are they estimate about 30 million dollars worth of loss between structures building whiskey uh the whole nine yards so you know that that's that's the when you hear about the heaven hill fire that that is the story of the heaven hill fire so if you ever hear of pre-fire whiskey what that what that relates to a lot of people and i was i thought this when i first kind of got into the uh, the bourbon game and started reading and, and hearing the stories i literally thought until i went to heaven hill that they just rebuilt a distillery right there on site i had no idea at the time when i first heard about this that the original distillery burnt and they moved production uh to another facility so uh, when you hear about pre-fire, anything that's pre-fire Heaven Hill will be DSP 31. If it's if the label says any other DSP than 31, it is not pre-fire. It's something else. It's Bernheim. It's sourced through somewhere else in that two or three year period that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but that's how you can quickly distinguish what's uh, pre-fire Heaven Hill or, or what's not. If you If the label for the bottle does not have the DSP number on it, then if you can flip it on the bottom, there's a couple of ways. You can look at the UPC code and you can Google the different UPC codes for uh, Heaven Hill uh, DSP 31 versus Heaven Hill Bernheim. Or you can flip the bottom upside down and do the reverse math. So if you find a, a bottle of Elijah Craig 12 year with the big 12 on the front label and it doesn't say what DSP it's from and you're not sure about the UPC, but you flip the bottom upside down and you see the two-digit year code of 04. You do the quick math backwards, 12 years from 04 tells you that's pre-fire distilled Elijah Craig. So there's some ways to, a couple, two or three ways to figure out if your uh, dusty bottle of Heaven Hill is a pre-fire dusty or just a dusty. Okay. Yep. So what they did, uh, so we always talk about, especially on this network, we talk a ton about how helpful the bourbon industry is. Uh, it seems like uh, there's probably been no bigger case, at least in my lifetime. Uh, I'm sure there's some some older stories, but there seems to be no bigger case of that in my lifetime than uh, how specifically Jim Beam and Brown Foreman. There's some others that helped out, but the big, the two big ones were Jim Beam and Brown Foreman helped out. So between the night of the uh, the fire in 96 up until around 1999 for that year and a half period uh, those two distilleries stepped up and uh, and and basically helped supplement some of the uh, the bourbon and the lost production and and so forth that heaven hill was going to have because they they had a year and a half almost two years where they they didn't distill anything they just had their stores and their stocks that survived uh, but their distillery was totally burnt to the ground. There was no repairing it and getting it up in order in six months or, or anything like that. Uh, so, so Jim Beam and Brown Foreman specifically, there were some others that, that stepped in and helped along the way. Uh, but those were the two that probably had the capacity to help. You know, it would be hard to, to walk down the road to Willet uh, with the size of their still and their and their distillery and say, hey, can you 
could you you know distill me this this uh, this bourbon recipe and and give me X amount of gallons of that? It would be hard to do, but someone uh, you know like Jim Beam and Brown Foreman at the time today, you could go to a number of places. You could go to Barkstown Bourbon Company. Uh, you maybe even go to Wilderness Trail. You could definitely go to, uh, to Heaven uh, to Brown Foreman Buffalo Trace places like that. Uh, but the bourbon industry stepped in and helped supplement uh, some of their production in those couple of years uh, until in 1999, they uh, were trying to make a decision whether to rebuild the distillery, which would be a brand new build on the same campus, uh, which was a, a ton of money. Uh, it, it would take a, a lot of time to do that. Or uh, they happened to, uh, to get an offer to purchase uh, KYDSP-1, which is the old Bernheim distillery in Louisville. Uh, so they did that. Uh, and so from 1999 until today, still today, uh, all of Heaven Hills products uh, that were distilled from 99 uh, till present are from uh, KYDSP-1, which is what they call the old Bernheim, which is now uh, considered Heaven Hill Bernheim is what it's really considered. Yeah. That's the difference in pre and post fire. And that is the largest bourbon distillery in the world. So yep. you know, we, we may think that, you know, Beam is the biggest. Well, Beam, you know, splits theirs up between, you know, their two main plants in Claremont and Boston. So so that's where, you know, uh, Heaven Hill's got the one big location. So uh, it's actually the biggest single location is right there. So, yeah, the interesting part of that is, is you know, a, a fire at a, at, a, at a bourbon distillery complex is never good especially one that takes out your entire distillery and your production capabilities. But if it was going to happen, uh, I would think that Heaven Hill was happy it happened in the time frame it did. I can't imagine it happening today. There's no one, especially with the distillery, with the capacity and size of the Bernheim, there's no one in their right mind would sell that for any amount of money, especially to a competitor. But right. in 1996, which is right in the middle of the, the whiskey glut, uh, there's the, the, you know, the, 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 the distilled spirits world, still heavy vodka, you know, whiskey starting to come back, but it's still not, you know, the, the hottest commodity at that time, you could still find all of today's unicorn sitting on a shelf, begging to be bought from, from anyone and everyone. Uh, so the timing of, of when, and in, in, in the bourbon chronology timeframe of when that distillery burned, there's probably only a, a 10 to 12 year window that could have happened to where that distillery would be available. And, and, and now that we're, we know what we know, it almost makes you wonder how much the, the Diageo group are kind of kicking themselves in the ass for selling that, that <laughs> oh, distillery yeah. to those guys. Yeah. I mean, they, they, it, that's, they, Diageo built the brand new current um, distillery out in Shelbyville for Bullet but they would have never had to do that if they still own that, that Bernheim distillery. Right. And so it is just uh that's the kind of a part of the story that no one really tells or writes about, but knowing what we know today, just the time period it happened was advantageous for heaven Hill because they would have been forced to probably either overpay for a different distillery that someone really didn't want to sell, but they decided to, because the money was so big or they would have had to build from the ground up, which would have been extremely costly and it would have, you know, had them outsourcing for even longer. So, you know, one of the other interesting pieces of information um, that I found is their product lines, even though they didn't distill for a better part of two years and seven of the 42 warehouses went down, 90,000 barrels went down, their process and their storage technique for their, uh, for their whiskey is pretty detailed and unique. And the way they the way they store, you know, so for the average person and me included, my my silly stupid head just thinks, okay, I've got 42 warehouses, and the first 41 are are full, and the next barrels that come off, just start going in the slots one after another, and you just fill them like plinko chips. That's not the way that that Heaven Hill did that. Uh, they segregated uh, barrels with different mash bills and barrels of different ages in different warehouses. So that they, if they ever lost, for whatever reason, a warehouse or multiple warehouses, they wouldn't lose all of their aged 
high rye mash bill or they wouldn't lose all of their their brand new make new barrels of rye or, or whatever the case is so each of their warehouses and their products and their ages of those products were so segregated into those 42 warehouses that they never had to drop an age statement because of the fire they made some decisions later in life uh, once the bourbon boom happened but they were able to keep all of their product lines fulfilled and they were they none of their products came off the shelf due to that fire even though they didn't just steal themselves for a couple of years so it's interesting that their process and thought pattern of what i call spreading the wealth so in a given yeah. warehouse you may have four different mash bills in that warehouse and you may have everything from a one month old barrel to a 26 year old barrel all in the same warehouse and you have some of that in each of the warehouses and yeah. that's how they were able to survive their product lines as well yeah the forethought there to do it I, I i never really thought about it you know i think of craft and i see everything is you know very separated and maybe everyone if they're not doing it especially to learn from what heaven hill did there is it yeah. should just all be integrated because yeah you're right that even losing those seven, it could have taken out entire product lines if it would have been all, everything would have been separated and segregated if it would have hit the right ones. Yeah, I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine? Uh, you know, so there's a, there's a couple of I can think off the top of my head. You know, Buffalo Trace to some degree is 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 at risk with Blanton's. So they store all the Blanton's in that one right warehouse, and I know why they do it, and I know the story, and it sounds real great, and it's it's a super story. And we actually talked about that some in our Blanton's Dusty event. But think about it. God forbid something happens to that warehouse, lightning strikes it, a tornado whips through, right. whatever the case may be. You're talking about Blanton's being a hard to find bottle. All of a sudden, it, it, it's gone for, or, for you know probably it's gone six, for years. six years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's a uh, it's interesting. It was a it was enough of a it was enough of an interesting piece of information that I read that I thought I wanted to add it to this to just to kind of give you the foresight of, you know, we always talk about how hard it must be to plan for production with age product when you don't know what the market's going to be six, eight, 10 years. But on top of that, just planning something like your rickhouse layout and where your barrels are going could make or break you in the event of an emergency. So it does uh, a lot of good foresight by the people there at Heaven Hill. Yeah. What about the Dant? J.W. Dant, do you have anything on him, the person whose this label is obviously named after? Yeah, I, I, for, for this event, uh, the event to me is, I, I do have a little bit. I actually uh, I wrote a pretty big article a couple of years ago about uh, J.W. Dant and that whole family. Uh, and it was written, I was kind of, I did two or three different pieces on some of the heritage names and families and labels that were prominent you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago that have kind of been mistreated and gone to the, you know, I did an Old Crow article, I did this article, but uh, yeah, as far as JW Dan, this this event was mainly uh, to, to do pre-fire versus current, and I used JW Dan to do that, but uh, JW Dan to me is probably, if there was a Mount Rushmore of not people, if there was a Mount Rushmore bourbon families, and we had to pick four, we were set in a room and Steve and I had to sit here and say four, four most important bourbon families uh, ever. Uh, the Bean family is at the top of the list. Right. Uh, the Dan family is in the conversation, if not in the top four, for sure. And we can argue about some of the rest. But to me, um, the, the Dan family, you know, it's a, there's a long line of dance in the bourbon industry still today uh through throughout the years they actually married into or i guess both families married into each other but married into the beam family so you have beams and dance kind of intertwined throughout the bourbon history all over the place uh, our good friend stephen beam uh, is actually married to someone from the dant family uh, we have wally dant who is opening up uh the, the log steel distillery on the old J.W. Dant Gessamain uh, distillery uh, piece of property, which is super cool and amazing to me. Uh, I've actually got an old bottle of that and it's unbelievable what they were doing back then at that, at that distillery in that location. Uh, but yeah, J.W. Dant is, is still, a, to me, it's, a, it's one of my top five bargain bourbons today. It's bottled and bond, it's four years, 100 proof, consistent. Goes, holds up in a cocktail, holds up in a plus one, uh, and it holds up if you just want to drink it neat or put it on ice. You can get it pretty much anywhere. 
uh, at least in this area you can. Uh, but yeah, uh, J.W. Dant, um, he was around well before Prohibition. He was the kind of the innovator of this, uh, you know, back when he was, uh, back when he was starting up, he didn't have a lot of money. They moved to Kentucky uh, with the prospects of trying to to get into the fertile soil and grow crops and live by the river and do what the what the uh, the frontiersmen did, and uh, he came up with uh, a method of distilling out of a log. So he took a log, split it in half, uh, put copper in the middle, distilled it into uh, a second smaller distilling uh, uh, apparatus, and it was very mobile. And he was able to to move up and down the river in the areas until uh, and he was able to to distill and sell whiskey. Uh, by the jug full initially and by the barrel later. Uh, and he was able to do that until he was uh, able to make enough money to uh, buy a small property and build a, uh, a proper uh, distilling operation and a proper warehouse and, and things of that nature. And then throughout the years, uh, the Dant family story kind of falls into uh, some similar sad stories of prominent families over the years where they survived prohibition. They came back really strong, 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, start getting into the 60s. The Dant legacy people kind of either started dying off or they really didn't want to get into the business. And the 50s, I think it was, early, mid 50s, I think it was, they sold uh, the brand um, away. It went through a couple of different hands. It was with Shinley at one time. I think it may have been with United Distillers or Seagram at one time. Um, and then it ultimately ends up, um, once the whiskey glut happened and the big five whiskey companies started disbanding, uh, later on that they, uh, they end up selling ultimately to Heaven Hill, which is where the brand sets today. Yeah. Yeah. And I see joining us, Tim Dant. So obviously ah. uh, Tim Dant signed up and I don't, I don't, Tim, I don't know you, but, uh, uh, I assume you're a family member. And if you want to tell us a little bit about the little family history, that'd be great. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, thank you, Steve, for putting this on. Wes, thank you for setting a little bit of the groundwork on, on my family. Uh, and to the rest of you gentlemen, uh, it's great to have you uh, share this uh, time. And I did get my samples, just FYI to confirm, I've got my two samples, <clears throat> which I assume we'll get into shortly. Yeah, we, we haven't tried it yet, so you're, 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 you're not behind. Okay, so real, real quick though, too, <clears throat> uh, Yes, my uh, great-great-grandfather was J.W. Dant. And Wes, you just talked a little bit about the family's uh, lineage. Born in 1820, uh, started as still in 1836. Uh, the migration that you mentioned basically goes back to 1785 and 87 when Basil Hayden, and I think all of you know who Basil Hayden is. Sure, yeah. He and, and, Joe, and, and uh, J.W. Dant's uh, great-grandfather migrated from Maryland to central Kentucky with a group of Catholic families. Uh, Catholicism was being outlawed in the state of Maryland, so they all moved together, settled up in Pottinger's Creek and Pottinger's area in Nelson and Marion County. So J.W. was born in 1820. Last year, of course, was his 200th birthday. Uh, we had actually reached out to Heaven Hill. We wanted to recognize my great-great-grandfather's 200th birthday. Uh, unfortunately, when COVID hit, uh, Heaven Hill was gracious enough to kind of acknowledge our request, but we really couldn't make anything happen. Although if you know Bernie Lovers, anybody know Bernie Lovers? Sure, oh, yeah. we know Bernie. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, Bernie and I met, and, and Bernie, who's the entertainer and also the brand ambassador for Heaven Hill, on May the 7th last year, which is the day that JW was born, 200 years later, Bernie Lovers, per my request, goes on to YouTube, and you could go back and check his YouTube, and did about a two-minute song with his guitar. Really? And recized JW Dance That's 200th cool. birthday. He's, and he's a class I act, really isn't he? Appreciated yeah. him doing that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I'm just saying, Bernie. He's just such a class act. That guy, he's amazing. He's a great ambassador for the industry, not just his he own is, brand. Is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the unique things, because my father, and one of the things, uh, my my generation, I'm fifth generation as as a great great grandson, is my father was one of thirteen kids. J.W. was one of uh, uh, nine kids, and he had 10 kids himself. Well, as you mentioned, Wes, coming out of Prohibition in 33, the dance still operated the Dant distillery down in the Gethsemane area. 
And in the 40s is when they sold out of it for the first time. And it changed hands multiple times from Arm & Hammer to United Distillers to National Distillers to Shinley Distillers. And then Shinley was operating it on the same land right now as our log still site, which we can get into that later. So, and then it went dormant. Uh, that site went dormant. Um, Shinley sold it to a couple of different people and then Heaven Hill stepped in in 1993 and purchased the date JW Dan brand and they produce it today, of course. Um, so there is some history and we always wondered as, as my generation, why did not my father and my uncles and aunts follow in the footsteps of JW and his sons? Well, obviously in 1941, when World War II started, seven of those 13 kids my dad was a part of went to World War II and they served. When they got back in 1945 after the war, their lives had changed forever. And we kind of surmise after talking to my, our parents and aunts and uncles that they didn't want anything to do with the bourbon business. They weren't interested. They wanted to go out on their own, do their own thing. And that's kind of what happened. And so to my cousin's credit, a couple of years ago, we were able to purchase the 300 acres in Gethsemane in New Haven, the very land that the Dant distillery sat on after prohibition has now been repurchased by the Dant family and we're going to reopen it with log still distillery at Dant Crossing. Yeah, that's and the so cool. the tasting room, which is one of the first components actually opens to the public on May 18th. I yeah. can tell you this because it's public information, but on May 18th, the tasting room, a two level 50 person venue that looks out over the uh, amphitheater that they're gonna build along the train station that runs down to the Kentucky Railway Museum in New Haven is all gonna open and it's going to be spectacular, absolutely spectacular. So, uh, aren't they talking about putting a, a, some sort of lodging too on the site? Yes, eventually? we've already opened one five-bedroom uh, oh, uh, bed and breakfast. As that's a matter cool. of fact, the five rooms, as you know, bed and breakfast have their own identity. And so each room in that, in that bed and breakfast has its own identity and has been named after the five wives of my five previous generations from JW Down. Hmm. And so it's a really neat way to honor the women as well uh, that were part of the Dant uh, lineage. Yeah. Wow. That's very cool. Very cool. cool. Well, we're, we'll check in with you in a little bit here too. We want to hear more about this, but we also want to drink whiskey. Yep. Uh, you know, we, we, we gotta, we, we gotta get to that because uh, I always find if you're at a whiskey event, you're not drinking the whiskey. People get uh, pretty, pretty restless. So let's, uh, let, let's, let's get to the, the comparison. Then let's talk a little Dant stuff uh, and the new distillery in just a second here. All right, you'll be just take over. Yeah, yeah. All right, so if everyone will grab, uh, so so real quick, just to remind everyone, uh, we have two samples. You guys are tasting blind. I am not, uh, for obvious reasons. Everyone else is tasting blind. So uh, what we have is we have a current uh, Heaven Hill DSP one Old Bernheim uh, current production bottled and bond JW Dant. Uh, the other sample is a JW Dant uh, that was distilled at Heaven Hill uh, DSP 31, uh, which is considered pre-fire prior to the 96 fire. So uh, that's the uh, kind of the, the main focus of, of, of this event tonight was we wanted to uh, kind of debunk or prove or give our opinion on this theory on whether or not uh, pre-fire Heaven Hill distillate is drastically different than Bernheim. Uh, and I chose the JW Dant brand because I'm a huge fan of the family history. I'm a huge fan of, of the brand. Uh, and what I found it to be again was of all the products that Heaven Hill produced now versus uh, pre-96, this is probably the one that leads itself to have not changed as much as far as age statements and things of that nature. It's pretty well a direct one-to-one -one comparison. So if everyone wants to, let's pour sample number one. Okay. And at your leisure, let's uh, nose it. And then let's, I'm interested to hear what the group thinks uh, about the nose. And obviously we'll get to the taste and so forth. Hey, hey Wes, a question. First yes, of sir. all, if, if, if we're tasting blindly, so we don't know yet which, which sample one is, correct? That's correct. That's correct. I'm the only one that knows so far. Before you reveal that, my only question is, is if Heaven Hill, chronologically, if Heaven Hill bought JW Dan in 1993, they were producing it from 93 to 96, and more than likely the same mash bill, the same recipe that my great-great-grandfather established, 
Are you saying that after the fire in 1996, that that recipe in Mashville changed? No, 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 I'm not stating that. What we're, what we're trying to uh, prove or disprove or give an opinion about is in, the, in what I call the bourbon geek world. Uh, there's people that, um, that so I'm a, I'm a huge Dusty fan. And there's a lot of Dusty fans and there's a, there's a segment of the Dusty fan population that are convinced, not specific to J.W. Dant brand, but are, are convinced that Heaven Hill products distilled at the Heaven Hill distillery, the DSP 31, are drastically better than anything out of the Bernheim DSP uh, 1. That, that's what we're trying. So I used, I, I did this experiment and this event through the eyes of the J.W. Dant brand because I felt it was the most comparable. It had not changed over the years as far as proof and age and things of that nature. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, Thank no, the, the, the Mashville and the whole nine yards, to my knowledge, has not changed at all. It's part of the reason I chose it as a vehicle for this activity. Thank you. Yep. On the nose, what's anybody getting on this one? I mean, there's certainly... I get some cherry. So what's that? I get some cherry. Some cherry? Okay. A little vanilla. Vanilla? Yeah. Yeah. I get the cherry vanilla. I get a little bit of the grain, a little bit of a, a little bit like a sweet corn, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your sweet corn comment. Yeah, to me, there's, especially with nosing, there's a there's a heavy like youth corn grain that you can get, but there's also a, a kind of a well-constructed youthful sweet corn. I think there's a difference in the two. Kent says smoky. I, there's a little smokiness factor there. Is Kent smoking a cigar while he's doing this? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's 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 taste it. Then we're all going to talk about it. We always like to, this is a small group, so everybody can weigh in on on taste and stuff like that. And we'll do the second one, and then we'll come back. We'll do them both again because we want to make sure that as we compare, because we're going to be voting on what are what's our favorite, yep. and, and so we'll we'll do that. All right. I mean, Cracker Jacks. That's what I taste. Kind of that, you know, if you get Cracker Jacks, it's got that darker caramel versus some of the other ones like Fiddle Faddle and that. It's a little lighter. The Cracker Jacks is the older. Yeah, Cracker uh, Jacks almost has that, it's that darker caramel that almost gets into like the sorghum realm. Yeah. It's really thick and sorghum? heavy. Yes, like sorghum molasses. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes. That's, that's what I'm getting. Big, big bomb on that. For sure, yeah, I get a I get a nice uh, I get a nice rice spice on this too, mm -hmm. and it's and actually for for a bottled and bond to me I get a, a pretty nice little hug and finish on this thing like it's not uh, it's it's a hundred proof but it's not uh, it's not a light hundred proof that's for sure yeah 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 it sticks with you yeah it carries a little heat and like you said a hundred proof bottled and bond it's always been that. Um, they do, just as a fun fact, they do produce, Heaven Hill produces an 80 proof. It's the JW Dant uh, Special Reserve that's sent to Japan. Oh, okay. uh, I know that. This is something that Bernie Lover shared with me. So it's a credible source that the Japanese prefer the lesser proof, 80 proof, and they, and they produce it for them at 80 proof. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of the, uh, if you look at any of the, current and past products that a lot of the U.S. distilleries send to Japan, you know, the, the Blanton's green label is 80 proof. It's a Japan market product. Uh, Wild Turkey at one time had the old dark label 80 proofer that was a Japan, uh, Asia market. So yeah, they're, uh, they, they're, they definitely prefer at least at one time and still do to a degree, uh, a bit of a lighter whiskey uh, as far as proof points go anyway. All right. Let's uh, let's like I said, ask some people here. Uh, Nigel, we'll yeah. start with you, man. What are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this as you taste this one? Kind of spicy. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely spicy. Certainly lingers, mm -hmm. and, and the oak for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe finishing, I don't know, peppery. Peppery, yeah. 
Yeah, this has a nice viscosity to it. If you see your, your glass, it's got some nice legs on it. So that coating across the tongue and like that, it, yeah. you know, that gets that pepper just to kind of evenly coat your tongue. And that's what kind of heats up after the fact. So, yeah, it does stick with you for sure. For sure. Nate, what do you think? Um, it's good. Mm -hmm. I, I was kind of making a joke saying it burns a bit because... Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> does it does it is it like a to, to you is it like a ethanol burn or is it more like a spice burn? Like a it's like a rivers of whiskey burn. I think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick, how about you, man? Uh, I I too have very little insightful to add. Um, mm -hmm. I think. I, I agree with everything that's been said here. I think I taste the caramel and it is a little bit spicy and I, you know, I enjoy it. Okay. All right. All right. Mr. Bill. I like it. It's good. Um, the, the heat on it uh, sticks around for just a little bit. And then when it starts to fade, you're like, damn, I wish it didn't fade, but yeah, it, it's, it's good. It's pretty awesome. Okay. All right. That's good. Kent. So the disclaimer is I am very congested. Allergies are bad. That's why I got my nose way over the glass, try to catch everything that come out of it. Something that wasn't said on the nosing, I get a little hint of mint mm -hmm. and I get a little of that late in the uh, sip. It's, it's, it's well into it. You know, it's, there's an awful lot of pepper and hot around it. It's kind of hard to taste a lot of that other stuff. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Winston, how about you? So I added a little bit, uh, just a drop of water to it, and it kind of smoothed out the burn a little bit, and it brought the caramel a little bit more forward uh, for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Emily, uh, you can uh, type in any comments. Emily doesn't have a computer with a mic or anything like that, so if she wants to add anything, you can add it over in the comments for sure. Uh, Mr. Whitlatch? Um, nice, sweet brown sugar up front and um, that nice warm spicy finish just seems to to grow it sticks yeah. around. it does stick around yeah mike i was thinking kind of like uh the cinnamon disc candy kind of oh yeah all blends the red hots and I get, okay yeah gotta get the nice the sweetness and then that the really enjoyable burn yeah the back okay all right. Emily agrees with the spice and heat comments. That's a, we're sure. at the legend. We haven't heard from the legend. Yeah, we got to have the legend check in, and then we'll go down to Tim, too. So, No, I think it's got some good caramel notes up front. You think and, it's a good uh, beach bourbon? <laughs> yeah. They're all good beach bourbons. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this one's going to be tough to beat. I, I like this one a lot, so it'll be interesting to see number two, because number one is certainly very enjoyable. That's good spice to it, too. Yeah. We, yeah. Are we ready to move to number two? I, I wanted Tim. we got to have Tim wait. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's any notes or anything. What are your thoughts, Tim? Well, first of all, I didn't cheat. I didn't try these before just now. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm either. curious which one was one and which one was two. Uh, I've been drinking J.W. Dan bottled and bond 100 proof for most of my life. And your comments about the caramel, the, the Red Hots was a kind of a neat comparison, which I like because I like higher proof bourbons because uh, I like to make uh, Manhattans and old fashions. And when I start to dilute it with the citrus and the simple syrups and so forth, I want a higher proof. But J.W. just always, I guess maybe I'm just, my palate is kind of used to it. Uh, but uh, you know, that, that burn, I guess I'm kind of used to, but it does go down pretty smooth. One of the things that I like to enjoy with uh, a, a glass of JW um, neat is, uh, believe it or not, Fritos. I don't know if you guys have ever had Fritos, oh, yeah. the bourbon, almond, almonds and pecans. Um, I've, got, I've got some relatives that eat pork rinds with, with JW. Um, <laughs> but uh, just all in all, it's just, it's just something... I've really enjoyed over the years. So okay. appreciate everyone's feedback. And by the way, the legend, Rick, are you the legend? 
He is the legend, yes. <laughs> if you hang out with him, you'll know why. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, if I could ask, where's the, that come from? Is it bourbon related? <laughs> so, no, we, we do. We, what is now an annual trip to Key West. And he got okay. the, the, the name down there because he would, he would be you know, out as late as anybody, 3 o'clock, 3.30, whatever the time was. Uh, the last person standing is with Rick Brenner, no matter what time it is during the day. And then for breakfast at 7 a.m., there's Rick Brenner down at the buffet hanging out oh, with, wow. uh, with Steve Beam, who got there first. So he was the first one there. And then there would be Rick, and then I would get down there, and then everyone else would filter in. But, yeah, so she got the name Legend because he was doing legendary things in Key West. So, yeah. Did you reference Steve Beam from Limestone Branch? Yeah, yeah, he's he's part of our group. You need to join us. We go down to Key West in uh, well, January. He, We're just getting that trip he's together. My, he's my cousin. If yeah, we I hang should... up, I'll explain to you how Steve and I are related. Yeah, I, I had to figure that. So I knew that yeah. uh, obviously he is part of the Beam and the Dan family. So yeah, he's we know his story well. He's done a lot of events with us and things like that. So yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right, let's move on to sample number two here. We're going to do the same thing. Let's nose it, share any nosing notes, and then we'll go through and have everybody weigh in on the taste, okay? Okay, very, very different experience here, I'd say. I was going to say that's so different. I had to rethink it here for a second. Mm -hmm. Gosh, this goes back to my other group when I'm leading these things. A lot of say bubble gum, and this is sweet, bubble gum-ish. I don't, I don't get the heat as much on this one on number no. two. No, as I did uh -uh. on number one. Yeah, maybe a little floral note too. I mean, yeah, this is a little more earthy. Yeah, yeah, earthy, yeah. yeah. All right, let's let's try it. Let's see what we get. We're getting on the taste here. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Very different. Very different. Yeah. Very. You wouldn't. Yeah, you know what I get? Uh, so after I took my first sip uh, and went back in and nosed it, I got heavy licorice. Mm -hmm. Really heavy licorice. And I'm not a licorice fan either, but I, it's a distinct smell for me. Right. Slightly less of the bitter at the very end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This finish is nowhere near as long on this one for me. Agreed. A little, little less spicy. Yep. This actually drinks to me a little more like, this drinks to me a little more like an MGP rye where a lot of the MGP ryes either have a dill, which I don't think this one has, but they, they typically have the mint and the spice notes from a rye, but they, they either filter towards the licorice flavor note or the dill flavor note this was uh it's interesting it doesn't have a lot of your traditional to me it doesn't have a lot of the traditional bourbon elements caramel vanilla butterscotch cherry stone fruits it's all this falls into licorice mint earthy notes maybe a little mm -hmm. bit of leather but Wes, yeah. this again, this this is 100 proof bourbon, correct? The number two sample. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. It's yeah. funny you said leather because one of the things I didn't say it, but it smell it tastes like the inside of my Triumph Spitfire. <laughs> <laughs> There's just something that reminds mm -hmm. me of that. Okay. Mm. English leather in the uh, in the seats. Yeah. Yeah, Mike. What are your thoughts on this one? The uh, the finish was, I mean, there was still some heat there, but it was a way more of an ethanol heat and way less pepper to me. Um, mm -hmm. So, the, and then it just kind of, it, it does finish quick. There, it didn't, it didn't linger, you know, around like the first one did. The first one was, it had a little more enjoyable finish. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Whitlatch. I thought I was tasting raisins initially, but I can't pick that up now. Mm -hmm. Got a peculiar, peculiar finish. Nothing like the other one. Okay. Okay. The legend. It's gonna. That doesn't quite have the mouthfeel that the first one did. Mm hmm Yeah. Got a lot lighter, shorter finish. Okay. All right, Winston. Um, so smelling it, I it, the first smell I took, it reminded me of Chex Mix, actually. Chex um, Mix, okay. Young grain and 
Um, but I do get the anise on it, the licorice, and adding a drop of water again brought that even more forward on it. Okay. All right. Kent, we know you're dealing with the allergies, but uh, anything stand out to you? Well, feels like you said next. I, I, I smell the anise now after he said that. Uh, yeah, the licorice is what was there with me. So I started going back and forth and nosing in between the two. And then coming back to this one, number two, it's got a very uh, grain husky smell to it after going back and forth between the two. So uh, it, it's interesting the difference in your nose after you've tasted both these and then going back and forth. Absolutely. I just went back and nose number one. And I can't remember who it was in the chat. I forgive me, but I think it was Nate. When I went back to number one and nosed, I got really heavy smoke, mm -hmm. like a campfire smoke. When I went back, it was interesting. Yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, um, Mr. Bill. There's there's nothing ugly at all about it. It's a uh, lighter. <clears throat> Uh, when it fades in, in there, there's an aftertaste of a of anise. Okay. Right. I like Emily. number one better. Okay. Well, it's not voting time just yet, but uh, that's uh, you can change that. <laughs> Bill always does that, and then a lot of times he will change because uh, uh, <laughs> we go through a second time, but much quicker as we go through the second time. But we will do that. Nick, what are your thoughts? So I actually, I, I don't, it's not so much a fundamental difference in flavor that I'm trying to go back and forth. Like I, I, I'm shocked the second one is a hundred proof because mm -hmm. um, it is much more mellow. I, I think if anything, I would say like, it almost tastes like the diet version of number one or something. <laughs> it's, I, don't, I don't think the flavor is like fundamental. Like I get a lot of the same flavors. It's just like the intensity yeah. is different. And, yeah. and so, you know, part, part of this may be that, you know, the one thing that we know for sure is proof is is a scientific measurement so but we also know that different whiskeys or the same whiskey of the same proof doesn't drink and finish the same way and, and so to me this comparing these two one of the things that's really stood out to me is a lot of times you know people i think maybe when they're drinking a higher um a higher proof bourbon and it kind of has that burn, they automatically assume that's a proof burn. But it doesn't mean that it's a proof burn. And I think in this case, we know both of these are 100 proof. One has uh, what we call a hotter or more spicy finish. I think the reality of it is it's not, it's, it's not necessarily a proof burn all the time at a higher proof. Sometimes it could be a higher rye content or it comes off as like a cinnamon or a pepper versus an earthy note or a fruity note. So it's, it's just kind of a, it's why I like doing these blind tests of things side by side, because it, it, it kind of can lead you to, to bigger conversations yeah, in sure. relation to tasting notes and so forth. Yeah. All right. Last one we didn't uh, have weigh in yet is, is Nate. Nate, what are your thoughts on the second one? Yeah, so this may sound weird, but the the first thing that came to mind after I tasted this was like um, like crushed tomato. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if that's like part of the mouth feel of it, like you know, the, kind of the the juiciness of it, or you know, when Bobby said Chex Mix, that kind of made me think, well, maybe it's like tasting it back to back to the other one, which was more had the sweeter notes. This is almost more savory notes, kind of like Chex Mix. I don't know, but that's that's the thing that came to my mind was tomato. So okay, I don't know. all right. Well, and I think I think you know one of the common themes, and I get it too, is this one tastes a little more earthy, or I don't I don't like using the word vegetative, but that would that would help explain things like grain notes, fruit and vegetable, or more vegetable than fruit notes. Is a lot of times those earthier. Uh, bourbons will come off as you know like a vegetable note or a green note or whatever the case may be right. so that that makes a lot of sense actually okay. all right what we'd like to do next is 
we do like to go back through one more time because as you taste the first one, you don't have anything to, to measure it with. You're just tasting it based on itself. Now you've tasted the second one. So to go back a second time allows you to do a little bit of a side by side and, uh, and helps establish the benchmark. So let's go back to the first one. We won't get into the detail. We won't have everybody weigh in on it, but feel free to uh, jump in with any comments uh, if you've got anything here that you think is different or, or you want to make a point of on the nose. Yeah, going right back from two to number one, the, the caramel pops for me. Yeah, really that's caramel pops big time. Yeah. Yeah. The guys yeah. have mentioned caramel early on. And that yeah, pop. that caramel and that smoky almost gives you like a slight creme brulee kind of creme effect brulee, to yeah. it. Sure. So to me, number, well, number one, I, I know these are both bottom bond. Number one just tastes like a much older whiskey than number two. And, I, you know, age is one thing and where it was in the warehouse and the weather and all that's another thing. But to me, it number one just tastes more finished than, than number two. Yep. So here's the here's the key thing to remember as we're as we're going to we're going to we've kind of resample one. We're going to do two and then we're going to take a vote. The only thing uh, different between I say the only thing, but the major factor between pre fire and post fire is the distillery and obviously that goes into the equipment and the whole nine yards. Everything is still stored uh, and housed in uh, at Heaven Hill uh, Distillery. To my knowledge, I don't think, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they're, they're storing anything at the Bernheim facility. I think, uh, no. I think they're distilling and everything is being aged uh, on Heaven Hill premises in Bardstown, and now they have Bardstown new, area. Yeah, Bards, yeah. Now, uh, they have like town, a, a, town, yeah, they have like the old Samuels Distillery. Yeah, that exactly. That. But, exactly. But yeah, that's it's, correct, that's still Bardstown. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Okay. Good. So okay. Um, anything else to note on our first sample? Yeah, the the finish is still really long, and I still get that peppery cinnamon uh, bomb yeah. on the end. So that yeah. has not changed. Yeah. Yeah, if, if you if you let it uh, kick out to the side, I mean, it'll give you a little zap. I mean, there's yep. such a, a peppery finish there where it's your tongue's a little bit more sensitive on the side. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it's it's interesting. That this is uh, this is good. So, all right, let's uh, let's jump back to to number two. Same thing, just high level. You know, anything of note. Sometimes going back does change things a little bit. The nose to me is still heavy licorice anise. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think uh, it, it just kind of, uh, to me, and maybe it's just because I just had number one and it had such a long finish, I'm still getting some of that finish along with this. But the second time around, number two, uh, the finish held up a little bit better, but it doesn't really compare to number one, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, if I had to guess, if I, you know, I know what this is. I, I know they're both bottle bond. I know they're both 100 proof. I would guess that number one's a higher proof. If yeah. you know, just totally doing a blind, not knowing, and you ask me, are they, is one higher than the other? Or are they the same? I would guess one is higher, but it is oh, not, folks. It is not. So, all right. Anything else to note on number two here before we start voting? It's, got, it's a lot sharper than the sweetness of number one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wes, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but I think it should be a two-part vote. Uh, okay. What is your favorite one or two? Okay. And which one do you think is the older one, one or two? Because it could be different. You could be like, well, I think this one's the older one, but I actually like the other one better. So okay. uh, do you mind if I do a two-parter here? Oh, do what you want, man. I'm good. Okay. So uh, I'll start uh, as you guys are on my screen um, and I'll come to you, Emily. Uh, you're last, but uh, be thinking about because we'll have you vote via the, the chat function, but uh, you're the last one on my screen. Uh, so the legend, you're first. So uh, two part question. Number one, which is your favorite one or two? And then the second question I'll be asking you, which do you think is the old one, one or two? So first one's simple, though. What do you like better? Which which is your favorite out of the two, one or two? Uh, one. OK, which one do you think is actually the older version, the pre fire version? One. OK. He was good. He did it. Uh, he did it exactly right. He didn't get confused. Okay. Unless he comes back later and says, wait a second. What? No. Uh, Mike, you're next. You're next one on my screen. So you're going to be the next one to vote. Which one was your favorite? One or two? I liked one. One. Okay. All right. Which one do you think is the old one? And Pretty I also far. think one was the older. The okay. Okay. All right. Mr. Whitlatch. 
One for both. One for both. Okay. Starting to uh, starting to set in here, Wes. We'll see though. It yep. can change. It can't change. Please don't vote what the crowd does. Vote what you personally think. Winston, you're next. Two Which for one's your both favorite? for me. Two for both. Okay. Yep. And I really like that Anna Snow. Okay. All right. All right. Next up is Kent Mace. Okay, so I don't follow directions well. So I, I, I want to make a comment first. I believe okay. two has more flavor. Okay. I like the age and the mouthfeel of one better. So I, I go with number one. Okay. And I do think number one is probably the oldest. Okay. All right. All right, Mr. Bill, which is your favorite, one or two? One for both. One for both. Okay. All right. Next up is Nigel. Yeah, unfortunately, I have to go for a one and one as well. One and one. Okay. All right. Uh, Nate? Um, I like one more by a lot. Okay. Um, and I can't leave my boy Bobby hanging, so I'm going to go number two for the old one. <laughs> number two for the old one. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Nick? Uh, as much as I enjoy being contrarian, I will go one and one as well. One and one. Okay. It looks like Emily went her favorite is number two, but she thinks one is the older one. All right. Next up, uh, Tim, what do you think? Well, I enjoyed them both. Uh, number two, I think the consensus was it's a little tamer, which I, th I thought was the case, but I do prefer number one. Okay. And I'm also going to guess number one is the oldest. Okay. All right. I'm doing the same thing as most people, as well as Tim there just did. I'm going number one. I liked better. And I'm going number one is the older one. So Wes, here's what it looks like. Um, we voted our favorite by a score of 10 to two was number one. And we guessed that the older one by the same score, 10 to two was a number one as well. So in reality, what's the actual results here? Yep. So one thing that's becoming apparent, we have a lot of, uh, and, and I thank everyone for this. We have a lot of the same uh, repeat uh, people that join our dusty events and they're starting to gain a pretty good palate for, and these blind tastings and, and they're becoming uh, uh, pretty accurate as to what's a dusty and what's not. So I think to no one's surprise, number one is the pre-fire. Okay. Uh, and number two is the uh, specifically a 2019 uh, JW Dant bottle. Wow. Oh, there you go. There 2019? You go. Yes, sir. It's, okay. Thanks yeah. for sharing that, Wes. That's good it, stuff. Yeah, no there, problem. There, there's, there's nothing ugly at all about number two. No, just, not at all. Number yeah. one was better. And, and number two, when you also factor in the price, that's a great value bourbon for sure. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so... Cool. Well, Tim, what can you, what else can you tell us about this new distillery open up? Cause I think we're all pretty excited about it. You know, we can't wait to see what's going on. Yeah. Well, it's anybody from Kentucky. Do you guys, anybody live in Louisville or Louisville? West? Louisville. Oh yeah. And Mr. Bill and Mr. Bill too. Okay. Well, I grew up there. Uh, uh, Bishop David high school class of 74. It's now Holy cross. Uh, I went to Western Kentucky university. So, but I live in Dallas, Texas. Now I worked for Hyatt hotels for 35 years, which brought me to Dallas, Texas. So I go back and visit my mom periodically, who still lives in the house I grew up in. But uh, so going back to Log Still and to Wes's point, where she did a nice job in kind of articulating how JW got started by using a poplar tree log and hollowing it out. And there was a term called stilling on the log. And that's why we came up with the term Log Still. My, my second cousin, Wally Dant, uh, whose grandfather Wallace actually lived on the Gethsemane site. And uh, there was a train depot there that's being redesigned that will open probably in the third quarter of this year. And that'll be along the railroad track. The, the, uh, the uh, New Haven uh, Kentucky Railway Museum is actually gonna reactivate this part of the train track. So trains now can take you down to log steel. You'll come off the train, be greeted at the train depot. And that's then cool. Up that's to really the cool. Theater and they can yeah. campus. It's really gonna be a campus that entails the 300 person outdoor amphitheater, the 50 person tasting room that looks out over the amphitheater. This is amazing. A 10 acre lake that will be stocked for fishing. Yeah. There's already one B and B open with five rooms. There will be three additional B and Bs open by probably the end of the year. 
cabins, cottages right next to the lake. It's going to be really cool. There's going to be fire pits outdoors that these uh, bed and breakfast will share. You'll have access to golf carts so you can drive around the path around the lake. And then about a half mile on the other side of the lake, it's a 300 person banquet facility called the venue. And we're going to build its very own chapel adjacent to it. So you can now get married and, and migrate right into the reception hall. And wow, there will be an great. outdoor uh, portion of that. So it'll be indoor outdoor wedding potential. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm excited as can be. This is a new tower is in place. And that water tower now reflects Log Still, a Dant family owned distillery. And that's the same water tower that was in place in the 1940s when my grandfather, William Washington Dant, operated that distillery after Prohibition. Oh, wow. So hmm. it's pretty special that the family is now back in the business. Um, it's a little bit of a slippery slope with regards to Heaven Hill owning the rights to J.W. Dan, although they don't own the rights to our name. We, you know, nobody can take that away from you. Uh, but we were really excited about this Dan Crossing campus. Uh, there's merchandise uh, to dancrossing.com and logstilldistillery.com. There's tons of information. All you have to do is enter your own email address. You will get constant updates. And quite frankly, if anybody wants to uh, get down there and get a personal tour, I can arrange that at any time. Uh, my first cousin, Lynn, is the COO. Uh, she's doing a fantastic job. Uh, her dad was my godfather. He passed away a few months ago in Louisville. Uh, and if you're from Louisville West, you probably know about the Backdoor Bar on Bardstown. Oh, Road. absolutely. Been there a bunch that's, of times. That's owned by John Williams Dant the third, And John is a descendant of Joseph Bernard. Now I remember, no J.W. Dan had 10 kids, okay? His first child, Joseph Bernard Dan, or J.B. Dant, is the one that started Yellowstone. Yeah. And this ties into Steve Beam. In 1872, the Yellowstone National Park opened. When J.B. Dant did not want to infringe on his dad's name, he wanted to come up with a name for his bourbon. So he sent his marketing guys out west. They heard about this state the national park, came back to J.B. and says, hey, this thing could be a hit. He goes, okay, let's name our bourbon Yellowstone. And he started Yellowstone. The Beams bought it back in 2010 to Steve Beams credit and his brother, Paul, they're doing a great job with it. Yeah. That yeah. started under a dance. Well, JB had a son um, named Sam who had John Williams, then John Williams Jr. And then John Williams III owns the back door on Bardstown Road. Oh, wow. I descend from William Wallace, the fifth of the 10 kids. And William <laughs> Wallace actually ran the distillery when J.W. retired in the 1880s. But William Wallace died in 1910 at only 50 years old, and that's when the youngest son, George, took over and then ran it into the 40s. Oh, wow. Wow. That's... So it's it just, it's an unbelievable, of course, bourbon, as you have, everybody knows, there's a lot of history, a lot of stories that go along with bourbon. You know, what, 90, 95% of the stuff comes out of the Kentucky right now, I think the statistics show. And it, it's just who we are. Yeah. It's in our blood, literally. And I love talking about it. So I really appreciate you guys giving me the opportunity. Well, we appreciate you, you know, signing up and just, you know, just yeah. getting a ticket and coming and being part of it. So, but, uh, but I can share you, but my email is, and I don't know if I sent this to you, Steve, through the whole contacting thing, but it's, it's just my name, lowercase Timothy Dant at gmail.com. I would welcome any emails from any one of you. And if any one of you want to get down to log still and get a personal tour and meet Wally or Lynn, I can set it up. They would okay. love to see you. As a matter of fact, this Friday, does anybody know anything about Jeff Mueller of Scotchy Bourbon Boys? Sure. Yeah, I know Jeff. Yeah. yeah. Well, out of Canton, Ohio, he does a he does a uh, podcast. So I coordinated a podcast for him at Limestone Branch at nine o'clock this Friday morning. Then he's going to go to Log Still and do a podcast with Wally Dant, and he's going to tie the Beam and Dant family lineage together in his Friday podcast. Yeah, that's cool. And Jeff Mueller is going to do that this Friday down in Kentucky. Yeah, cool. So, uh, but no, I'd be more than happy to help anyone out if, if you need anything. Please let me know. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we'll... Hey, Tim. Yes. Is there, is there actually a log still going to be on site at the log still? Well, when, when you go into the tasting room and then eventually when the distillery opens in, in the visitor center, there's going to be a restaurant and a bar. In the visitor center, we want to try to create a mini damp history museum. I'm actually the historian working on the Dan family tree and JW had 10 kids, 53 grandkids, 112 great grandkids and all the way down. 
currently I have 1,200 names on paper that I have vetted to go all the way back to JW. And we want to try to create with some technology a way for everyone who's related to go in and find out how they connect to JW. So the log still itself, we're going to try to kind of recreate that and potentially have it on, on showcased in this uh, museum. Can I ask, will it be a Vendome log still? Uh, <laughs> well, they have Vendome equipment now. Yeah, it's a beautiful still. It's like a 30 foot uh, circuit. Well, you know, the, you yeah. know the technology of the, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's gonna be uh, phenomenal, so. Yeah, we, uh, I'm, I'm a huge bourbon history dusty fan. And I think before you were able to join, I kind of led the, uh, the event off with just, uh, we, Steve and I were talking and we had stated that if we had to, to put a Mount Rushmore of four bourbon families, not a, not an individual person, four bourbon families, and we had to, you know, someone said, you have to pick four, where are they going to be? Uh, to me, the beams and the dance are two of the four, and it's not a, it's not even a discussion with those two. And then we can discuss the other two from a, from a other uh, number of family, including the Medleys and the Watlins and, and, and the, right. and, you know, and, and uh, the Browns and so forth. But to me, uh, I've, I've always just believed that the, the beams of the dance are, are right up there and would be on that uh, family, bourbon family Mount Rushmore along sure. with uh, two other deserving families for sure. Yeah, that's a cool idea, Wes, actually. Yeah, that yeah, is. Because like, we always talk about individuals, but the family thing. The is family is, yeah, yeah that's the key. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and, and that'll be the theme of, of, uh, of his, uh, Jeff's, uh, podcast this Friday and of course Steve Beam and Wally will be there of course they've known each other for years and we are related uh, uh our uh I'm sure you guys have known throughout your lives in a family where you've had a brother and a sister marry another brother and a sister oh yeah well that's what happened with with Steve Beam and myself mm -hmm. my grandfather married a woman whose brother married his grandmother <laughs> and so Steve when you talk to Steve about this he'll tell you oh yeah we're double related <laughs> he likes to use that term that we're double related and it has to do with the the brother and the sister who married a brother and a sister yeah but yeah. uh yeah it's classic bourbon stories yeah that's very cool well, we got to get west there uh to do some behind the scenes stuff for us so we'll definitely get him hooked up to uh uh, yeah, let me know, you let me know about, if I can help. Goodness. I'd be more than happy to. So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll I'll reach out to you for sure, Steve. Yeah, yeah. We're working on a uh, a documentary too on uh, running on a log because that was a uh, dance weren't the only one doing that. Uh, that was a uh, uh, you know an old school way, and we're gonna we're going to it, at some it, point. And I, I have contact. Any... What's that? Wathens Wathens did it too. Wathen yeah. Richard Richard Wathen. Yeah, Richard Wathen was uh, yes, also okay. just still yeah, on the log. Right. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to work on this, um, this documentary and I, I've talked to, uh, Wally about it through, through the PR people that okay. when we do it, uh, we're going to get like a panel there. Cause we want, we want to get, you know, like you see these documentaries where a group of experts gets together because we're doing something that hasn't been done in a very long time. Sure. And, 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 you know, we know in theory how it works, but we want to get a group of experts there and then actually do it. And, uh, it sh should be a, a fun thing. I would think for bourbon oh, yeah, fans absolutely. to see that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Should be, should be cool. Cool. Anything else? Anybody in Dallas? Anybody in Texas? No? Texas. Used to be, but not anymore. Okay. Well, Oklahoma City is pretty close. Well, well, Texas is trying to give Kentucky a run for its money on bourbon. You guys probably know that. And I'm a member of the Louisville Bourbon Society. I'm also a member of the Dallas Bourbon Club. And the Dallas Bourbon Club, we, we limit our uh, membership to 200. There's about 800 who want to get in. But what we do is we're fortunate enough to get a few... Uh, barrel picks. So when we get a barrel pick, as everyone knows, a typical 53 gallon bourbon barrel, you can get anywhere between maybe 150 to 175 bottles of 750 size, you know, based on evaporation and so forth. So it allows each member to get one of these, these bottles when we get a barrel pick. But they, uh, they know all about logs still. They want to make a trip to Kentucky and, and see it firsthand. Uh, we did a giveaway at our Christmas present or Christmas uh, party this year with bottles of JW Dent. Uh, and that I gave away at the, then it was, it was outstanding. And then the Louisville Bourbon Society, we now meet at the Fraser Museum. I'm sure you're familiar with the Fraser Museum, oh, yeah. sure. which is a gorgeous facility. And uh, so, but we're not meeting face to face yet. We hope to do that hopefully later this year. So. Are you an Iron Root fan? Iron Root? Yeah. Uh, Denton? Mm. Old, Old Republic? 
in Denton, Texas. Yeah. Actually, I don't. I live 20 minutes from Denton, but I'm not Iron Root. Check out Iron Root. They're okay. It's fabulous stuff. Yeah, they're doing okay. some good things. The licorice family. So yeah, check them out. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. Well, with that, we'll end the official part of today. Say goodbye to the folks that are watching at home because some do uh, buy a ticket. And they watch it and then drink their whiskey as they're going through that. We'll say goodbye to them. And uh, I'll stick around, though, if anybody has any questions or anything like that. 